training ground for the next generation. But I think that one of the key things that we do that we're very proud of is make sure that we're not an ivory tower, that we're out there training people to be working out in the field, and that the most, almost all the faculty uh, is also out uh, doing preservation almost every day, and that it is a key thing for us to host events like this. Uh, we've done a paint conference, we've uh, hosted APT, we're gonna be doing a stone conference uh, next year. Uh, so I was thrilled when, when Richard Piper asked if we would host uh, a cast iron event. I have to say that um, I am one of my favorite activities in getting the public excited about historic preservation is, is giving walking tours. And the first walking tour I ever gave was when Margot Gale, whom I think I'd known for all of 10 minutes, twisted my arm and said, well, you're gonna be giving a walking tour for us. This was typical of uh, Margot. The minute she met you, you were, you were working uh, hard for Friends of Cast Iron. Uh, and that is what got me into um, to leading walking tours around New York, which I have not stopped doing. So um, I wanna thank uh, the people that put this together, that brought this to Columbia, and welcome all of you. Uh, and I know that it'll be a really terrific day. And I'm not sure who I'm handing it off to. Thank you, Andrew. I'm Deborah Slayton. I'm on the board of the Historic Preservation Education Foundation, the co-chair of the symposium, and a principal with Wiss Jenny Elsner in Northbrook, Illinois. And on behalf of Historic Preservation Education Foundation and all of our co-sponsors, I'm very happy to welcome you to the symposium. Um, I would like to mention our sponsors in addition to HPEF. Oh, thank you. In addition to HPEF, we have American Institute of Architects Historic Resources Committee, Association for Preservation Technology Northeast Chapter, Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, Allen Architectural Medals, Historical Arts and Casting, Jan Hurd Pokorny Associates, McLean Metal Works, Old Structures Engineers, PC, OLBN Architectural Service, Inc., Robinson Iron Corporation and Wiss Jenny Elsner Associates. And we also would like to thank Association for Preservation Technology, Delaware Valley Chapter, the Donald Judd Foundation, Dokomomo U.S. Tri-State Chapter, Landmark West, Preservation League of New York State, and Victorian Society of New York. So as you can see from that list, we have very good sponsorship. And as you can see from this full room, we have quite good attendance. So. We're very pleased to start our program today. A couple of very brief logistical items. There are signs pointing you to the restrooms and other important functions outside. We have seven excellent student helpers, several of whom will always be at the registration desk. So if you have any questions, stop by the desk. Many people have asked about AIA credits. The symposium is eligible for eight credits and the walking tour tomorrow for an additional one and a half credits. You can sign a form at the registration desk. If you're an AIA member, please include your number. If you're not an AIA member, please note that you're not a member and we will send you a certificate after the symposium. You um, should have in your packet, in addition to some interesting material from our sponsors, a copy of the conference program with a detailed schedule. And I think since we're starting a little bit late, without any further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker. So um, Carol uh, is coming down, great. <coughs> Carol Gale is Associate Professor of History at Lake Forest College, where she is also the Associate Director of the Graduate Program in Liberal Studies. She is the author with Margot Gale of Cast Iron Architecture in America, The Significance of James Bogardus, published in 1998, and numerous articles on cast iron architecture, including Translating the Column into Iron, Bogardus and the Emergence of Cast Iron Architecture in America in La Construcción de la Cologne, 2008, and the Emergence of Cast Iron Architecture in the United States, Defining the Role of James Bogardus, published in the APT Bulletin in 1998. Carol Gale. 
Good morning. If you are quite a crowd on an early morning. Um, so I want to, I'm, you're specialists in a very knowledgeable audience, but I want to give a very general talk, a survey of cast iron architecture in the 19th century, especially in the United States. So much of what I say will probably be review for one or another of you. For centuries, the use of iron in architecture uh, was constrained by its relative scarcity and relatively high cost. It was the Industrial Revolution of the 18th century, with its numerous advances in technology and vastly increased scale of production that made iron widely available um, and relatively inexpensive. Iron came to be used extensively in industrial and everyday life, first in Britain and Europe and then in the United States, and iron could now be employed for a large scale for large scale architectural purposes. In earlier times, most iron used in buildings had been wrought iron, but from the end of the 18th century, iron came into wide um, use um, and soon overshadowed wrought iron. About the middle of the 19th century, iron founders and architects developed ways of using cast iron to create multi-story self-supporting facades, which tended to appropriate the name cast iron architecture. And it's that that I'm going to be talking mostly about. That's, a, in effect, a summary of my approach. Iron, and particularly cast iron architecture, played an essential role in the growth of American cities in the mid and later 19th century, especially in the commercial world. However, by the last decades of the 19th century, new technological developments brought the price of steel down to a level where that metal could be used freely for architectural purposes. And by the 20th century, steel had replaced cast iron as the architectural medium of choice. Now, I know many of you know this better, but just a quick review of the, the basic ferrous alloys. Wrought iron is the alloy that contains practically no carbon. It's ductile and can be hammered into many shapes. It has great tensile strength. Before the 18th century, most um, iron was uh, produced in bloomeries. That is, these very small, simple furnaces, small open hearths in which iron ore was heated with charcoal until the ore became a bloom of spongy metals that could be worked by a blacksmith into wrought iron. And this slide is of the William, in Williamsburg, a bloomery, and it's courtesy of Richard Piper. Um, the making of wrought iron in this traditional way was very labor intensive. Um, it was, uh, iron, wrought iron was often used for architectural purposes, but mostly on a small scale. For instance, straps, nails, hooks, and small beams, and also fences and decorative pieces. The second ferrous alloy is cast iron, which is high in carbon and therefore brittle, but has great strength and compression. Uh, as bigger and more complex furnaces were developed, drawings of bloomery and blast, um, okay, so the, th this is a drawing of, a, of, on the left it's a bloomery and on the right it's a blast furnace and you can see just from the size of it um, the way that it's likely that the blast furnace is going to produce a higher temperature than can be a, uh, achieved in the bloomery. In the late 18th, late 18th century, blast furnace produced liquid metal rather than that bloom of spongy metal, which was then poured off and cast into the desired form in sand molds or turned into pig iron uh, to be later cast into forms. And so uh, this is a, a picture of the blast furnace, a re an imagined, um, an, an illustration of what they think the Hopewell, Hopewell um, um, blast furnace in Pennsylvania was like, um, it's, and then it's done by the National Park Service. Um, production of cast iron soared in the last part of the 18th century. The invention of the cupola, which you can see here, um, the uh, invention of the cupola made it possible to raise the heat high enough to remelt cast iron pigs which then made it easy to cast finished iron products far away from the source of the ore. So that added more flexibility. 
The third alloy, steel, has moderate carbon content, and it has some of the qualities of both wrought and cast iron. Strong in both tension and compression and very versatile. Uh, major technological advances in the 1850s and 60s, which allowed the burning away of some of the carbon and cast iron and the use of low-grade ore, made it possible to produce steel in large quantities and at low prices. Now steel became a medium that could be widely used for constructing buildings, and the steel frame combined with some other inventions of the later 19th century led to skyscrapers that began to rise in the late 19th century. So for most of the 19th century, though, wrought and cast iron were the ferrous alloys used for building purposes. By the early 19th century, the supply of wrought iron expanded greatly, and new rolling machinery uh, allowed its use as girders uh, in bridges and rails for the newly and rapidly developing uh, railroad industry. But it was cast iron that really made the 19th century the age of iron, with capitals there. Cast iron had been employed occasionally for architectural purposes earlier, but as the revolution, the industrial revolution increased the supply of the metal exponentially, it began to be employ, employed on a large scale for a wide variety of uses, including architecture. And I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of some of the forerunners, which are uh, from Britain. The um, first is the Iron Bridge in Shropshire, um, Colebrookdale. It was built in 1779 by Thomas Pritchard and the iron founder, Abraham Darby, uh, who is credited with some technological advances in the development of cast iron. It replaces, a, it, goes, it spans the Severn River, uh, 45 feet high, and it, a span of 100 feet, so a really sizable um, construction for the time. It was the first metal bridge in the world, but soon iron bridges were being built um, widely. The next item is the beige flax mill. And this is a, um, in, in Britain in the late 18th century, the textile industry faced with just the scourge of fire, which would be fed by the dust created by, the, by textile um, production. Um, they tried, de really sought to find a way to make, um, uh, to create fire resistant mills. And so in 1796, this is another sort of landmark. The builders of this mill near Shrewsbury employed iron columns um, and also iron beams combined with brick flooring and walls in order to create a mill that would be less susceptible to fire than, a, um, than some of the other forms of construction. And then, so that this is a, a major step forward and you have here the, the structural use of iron, cast iron. Um, glass and iron structures became very popular in the first half of the 19th century. Filling an iron frame with glass allowed natural light into a structure. And remember, this is before electricity, even before oil lamps. Or, um, this is a time of um, candles and other, um, I, I guess, eventually oil lamps. But interior lighting is, um, is very hard to come by, and therefore natural light would be much desired. So it was used in, um, often used in train sheds, in covered passageways, the French like those particularly, Covent Garden in um, London, greenhouses, botanic gardens, and most dramatic were these um, big iron exhibition halls, such as London's Crystal Palace in 1851. Um, uh, here you see the interior of that cast iron ribs made it possible to create these vaulting um, spaces filled with glass, so it's flooded with glass, and there you see Victorian people uh, gathering to admire all the wonders of the production of Victorian industry. Now, the United States was much slower to build with iron than was Europe. The cities of colonial America were relatively small, and building materials such as wood, stone, and brick were widely available. There were, there were plenty of small foundries, but these produced on a small scale. Typical cast iron products produced um, balconies and balustrades, stoves. Diana Waite has written a lot about the stoves of the 19th century. Um, soup kettles, soap kettles, cookware, 
and in the many forges, blacksmiths produce wrought iron for horseshoes, rods and nails, straps and latches, or decorative screens and fences. Most finished and major iron products were imported from Britain. Then in the first part of the 19th century, the United States entered into a long period of growth and its cities grew rapidly. The nation possessed ample supplies of iron ore and coal, which was now replacing charcoal in iron making, and it had the advantage of borrowing cutting edge technology from abroad. Cast iron was often used for water and gas mains in the growing cities, uh, sewage pipes, Architects such as William Strickland of Pennsylvania began to employ iron in um, columns as weight-bearing members in the interiors of larger buildings. This is the um, 1835 to 37 um, New Orleans Met um, building con that is constructed between 1835 and 37. And in the same building, he installed attractive iron cast iron stairs. Commenting on an iron market that he erected in Philadelphia, Strickland said, there is perhaps no better object of architecture than a market house for creating an iron construction to exhibit its delicate but strong and durable purposes, properties, so that architects were aware of the advantages of, um, of iron, cast iron. In the 1840s, as part of general economic expansion, America entered its own Iron Age. Domestic production and use of iron grew by leaps and bounds. Prices fell. Imports from Britain diminished. And in the ensuing decades, cast iron was used for large machines. Both cast and wrought iron were used extensively for bridges and for the proliferating railroads. Um, builders of factories and commercial buildings increasingly employed iron framing in an effort to reduce the danger of urban fires, which was a scourge uh, in our country as well. Um, probably the most widespread use of cast iron in American construction in this period came in the first um, floor shop fronts, the, on the first floor of a building, an iron st shop front, a simple post and lentil construction. Slender columns would be employed. Um, slender columns would be employed um, uh, to, to support the, um, a, a cast iron beam across um, and that would open up wider, wide window apertures which let in natural light and also allowed the merchant to display his merchandise. And this is a uh, handbill from um, Daniel Badger. Um, it's actually from about 1848. There were a few sc scattered examples of such cast iron storefronts in the 1820s in, in 30s in the United States, but it was in the 1840s that they really became widespread. This handbill for the firm of Daniel Badger, which is printed about 1848, shows such an iron shop front on his own factory in New York City. Badger, who would later become one of the most prolific manufacturers of architectural iron, is specifically advertising rolling shutters the, that are filling those windows, and then you can see where they're partially uh, rolled up and the, at the door and the two windows right beside the door. Uh, these iron shutters were set in grooves in the iron columns and uh, this is a, a schematic drawing of it, how it worked and they could be rolled up. You can see the, uh, the, the, um, the chain by which they were pulled up or let down and they could be um, pulled down, let down at night to protect big glass windows and the merchandise inside. Um, cast iron shop fronts spread throughout the country and can still be found in big cities and small towns all over the America. In Iron Rich, Pennsylvania, John Haviland used cast iron in a completely different manner in his Miner's Bank, which was erected in 1830-31. Um, this, uh, this is Haviland's own drawing. Although the building was a traditional masonry, um, masonry structure, Haviland veneered the entire front with iron plates and made to look like cut stone. And they're fastened on with wrought iron prongs, or they were fastened on. This, um, this photo is from 1869. The building was demolished in 1926. 
So it's against this background, that is the use of iron for architectural purposes, that we turn to the development of a specific architectural use of cast iron, that is the multi-story, self-supporting, all iron facade, what is now most commonly meant by the term cast iron architecture. Although I know that many of you are specialists in this and work with a variety of uh, cast iron um, elements that have been created in cast iron, like fences and cemetery um, enclosures and gardens and urns. There are all kinds of uses of cast iron from the 19th century, even though I'm going to concentrate on uh, cast iron architecture in the sense that I just defined it. It was um, the first full cast iron facades were erected by James Bogardus. Um, here is it shown as a young man. We think this portrait is from about 1831. And he created these uh, buildings in 1848 and 1849, the very first ones. Uh, he was an inventor from New York, Catskill, New York, who'd spent several years in London where cast iron was widely employed for industrial and architectural purposes. So he saw it all around him. And then he briefly, in 1840, he briefly toured the European continent, including Italy and specifically including Venice. A pamphlet published by his firm in 1856, which is, was meant to promote the spread of cast iron architecture, describes how he arrived at the idea. It was while in Italy, um, contemplating there the rich architectural designs of antiquity, that Mr. Bogardus first conceived the idea of emulating them in modern times by the aid of cast iron. And indeed, the versatility of cast iron allowed the construction of buildings in any style desired, which in the mid-19th century meant ornate and imposing buildings generally, uh, in the style of Italian Renaissance palazzos or of the French Baroque. So Bogardus acquired property on Duane Street in Lower Manhattan and planned to build an iron factory to house the manufacture of his inventions. Soon after he had started work on the factory uh, in 1848, he was diverted by a commission from a pharmacist and civic leader, Dr. John Milau, to put a new iron front on the narrow three-story brick building on Broadway that was his place of business. Uh, you can see it there from an 1845 um, uh, illustration. Bogardus erected the all iron front in just three days during the summer of 1848, probably because he could use iron components that he had already cast for his planned factory. The result uh, was a taller building, five stories versus three and a half, with more window space, three, uh, five, four windows versus the three. The facade was also more richly decorated with its fluted columns topped by classical faces, the rinceau above the, the, each window, and a cast iron panel decorated with a star starburst in the space below each window. The building and all other cast iron <coughs> buildings would have been protected by several coats of paint probably in a light cream or earth tone or drab, as they sometimes called it. Um, well, you could use any color, but uh, several coats of paint in order to protect the iron and to make it also to make it appear that it was constructed as stone. This was the mimicking effect and the way that cast iron, that Bogardus thought of cast iron as providing an opportunity to create uh, impressive buildings without having to have each piece hand carved. Before he could return to work on his factory, Bogardus received another commission, this one to erect a, ca a new cast iron fronted building on a five lot parcel at Washington and Murray Streets in Lower Manhattan. The owner of the lots was Edgar Lang, who wished to build a five story unit on his property so he could rent the stores to businessmen who, men who were connected with the nearby Washington Market, a big green uh, fresh market. Um, the um, Bogardus worked quickly, his task eased by the fact that the new structure could be anchored to two adjacent buildings, and again, um, probably using some of the components already cast for his own factory, while more components were being <coughs> cast. So again, the construction was very speedy, 
uh, just taking a couple of months, and the Lang stores were, create, were completed by May of 1849. By combining the components in a different manner than in the Milau pharmacy and employing fewer decorative elements, although they're still the same ones, Bogardus produced in the Lang stores a simple and elegant design that seems almost modern, particularly because of the large window spaces that cast iron construction made possible. The, the, this uh, is a picture, a photograph from about 1950 when it was still somewhat in use. This is a photograph from the, um, uh, the early 18, 1970s when it was about to be taken down. And so the, uh, the awning, which was a later addition, um, it wasn't in Bogardus' original um, construction, has been removed. And here you can really get a sense of this sweep of glass and the way that it really has a kind of modern look. We know a great deal about the Lang stores because in 18, 1971 they were carefully disassembled. Um, here's a workman up on the, uh, on the girder taking it apart. Note the wood beams uh, that are over there on the right, and I could I be referring to them later. I mean, you, that is to say you can see that the framing was in um, conventional framing, or at least part of it. Um, so we had measured drawings of the um, structure by John Waite, uh, who, and so we are able really to say how this building was built, and we extrapolate this back to um, many of the other uh, early cast iron buildings. The disassembled iron um, members were photographed, <coughs> Um, the, here they are piled up, and you can see the flanges cast into the columns and the, the, the holes for the bolts. These are, um, and here you can see laid out in a way that makes it helpful, the three main components that Bogardus used in his modules uh, that composed the, uh, the Lang stores. Hollow C-shaped beams, Half round column, uh, half round fluted columns with the flanges, and a spandrel with the starburst design, although it's a really obscured there by, um, by wear and tear, to fill the in frame space below each large window uh, opening. The rear and side walls were brick, and the floor and inner support system were of wood. This cast iron is based on this principle of repeating repetitive use of modules, such as this one, and, and that's really part of Bogardus's invention. So now, after completing the Lang stores, Bo finally Bogardus could turn back to his own partially built factory um, on Duane Street. The work went quickly and was finished in the second half of 1849. Um, and this is a lithograph of the building re completed in 40, 1849 or 50, Bogardus used it for advertising purposes, and it's really one of the few images of, it's the only image, and this in a slightly different version, of the factory. So you'll see it all the time. You probably know it well. Uh, it was large and impressive four-story structure. We see the same cast iron components as in the Milau Pharmacy and the Lang stores. Fluted columns anchored with classical heads, uh, supporting cast iron beams, the star bus starburst spandrels, and the Ranceau, all combined in such a way as to be more ornate than the earlier buildings. However, like the Lang stores, a large proportion of the walls are open apertures filled with glass, that, and that would have let in copious light into the interior. Bogardus claimed that the factory was made entirely of iron, but this has been disputed by some authorities on the basis of circumstantial evidence. But for our purposes, that really doesn't matter. That debate doesn't matter. The factory taken together with the Lang stores and the Milau iron facade clearly proved that it was possible to build attractive, self-supporting facades entirely made of cast iron. Using methods of mass production and prefabrication and to do so rapidly and economically. In 1850, Bogardus sought to patent the methods he used in cast iron construction and here's the first page of his patent application. Um, but only some of the, um, and here also is uh, 
an illustration, actually this is out of the 1850, his promotional pamphlet, showing his methods of construction. <clears throat> but only some of his techniques <clears throat> were recognized as new inventions, while several others were deemed to be common knowledge among iron founders and, iron founders and builders. <clears throat> Indeed, it is probably true that there was wide knowledge of the necessary technology. The time was ripe for cast iron architecture, and there were a number of ways to build such structures. And so uh, there, in some senses, many people, uh, it is legitimate to see the invention of cast iron as James Bogardus, but also a number of other uh, workmen and craftsmen. Bogardus was kept quite <coughs> busy in the 1850s, but almost immediately <coughs> other iron founders and builders began to construct total iron fronts also. Bogardus, working with the architect Robert Hatfield, erected a large five-story commercial structure with two full cast iron fronts for the Baltimore Sun newspaper in 1850-51. And this was for some relatively young publishers who had gotten together and were uh, publishing the, the Baltimore Sun, an inexpensive popular newspaper. This is a contemporary illustration. And then in this building, we see the uh, emergence of the Italian palazzo style that was so fashionable in the, in, that, in the middle of the century. This is a photograph from the 1890s, and it gives you, it's a little easier to see uh, than in the other. But in the same years, so this, this is Bogardus, but in the same years, uh, exactly, 1850 to 51, the Penn Mutual Life Insurance Company uh, had a building erected by a different architect, G. Parker Cummings and a builder, Joseph Singerly, who was from Philadelphia, also in the Italianate style. Uh, this is one of the earliest cast iron buildings in Philadelphia and indeed in the whole country. So this is, there's the immediate diffusion of um, th this uh, cast iron architecture and, and many people can accomplish it. In 1853, the legendary New York Crystal Palace was erected in mid-Manhattan uh, one of the most um, famous of the early cast iron buildings in the Italianate style is the Howitt Building. Uh, this is a drawing from Badger's uh, catalog, and Badger supplied the iron for this building. Uh, it was erected in 1856 by architect John Gaynor. Um, the Howitt Building is the oldest standing cast iron front in Soho, where some of you, will, some of you know and some of you will go tomorrow. Uh, and it was, uh, early on, it was designated an historic landmark and has become a sort of icon for cast iron architecture. For a while, it was painted reddish brown, uh, but today, and this is a slide courtesy of Richard Piper, uh, it is very well maintained and now painted this kind of creamy off-white. Uh, this is the virtues of um, Soho's Renaissance as a, as a commercial and art district. In 1854 and 55, Bogardus erected a building for Harper Brothers, publishers. Uh, and this represented a new stage in cast iron architecture in several ways. Um, that is, I'm getting something different on my screen here. Okay. Um, Th this is a, uh, the, the projection is slightly different. This front actually extends at length down the street. And what I see here has that length. I don't know quite why it is so compressed <coughs> that way, but take it for me that, it, that it, um, uh, it's a long continuous front down Pearl Street. Uh, this was, a, a, and the second way, so part of it is the length of it that was unusual. Another way that it was unusual was the effort on the part of the builders to enhance the fire-resistant qualities of cast iron. To start with, the two buildings of the plant, and the second one is uh, on Cliff Street behind the other on Pearl Street, they're, and they're joined by an iron stairway and underground passages. Uh, but this, this, has only, this is an all-brick building, a brick facade but they all, both have all iron framing sheathed in brick and, con and also concrete floors. 
The builders took advantage of uh, the new technology in wrought iron, incorporating the I-beam that was just being produced by Peter Cooper's Trenton Iron Foundry. And this allowed them to span large open spaces, uh, open areas, so that this is also part of why it's new. By using wrought iron beams uh, in, the, in the form of the I-beam, they were able to open up even more interior space. Um, bowstring girders, which cast iron members employing wrought iron rods, um, were used in combination with the wrought iron beams, which you can see uh, up at the, um, in, the, in the columns above the decorative part of the um, uh, bowstring girder, be just below the starting of the next column for the next floor. You can see one of those, a cross section of one of those beams. Um, and so these, uh, we've got um, uh, the, the brick jack arches and, and the concrete floors. Moreover, both the columns and the girders were visible, serving as ornamental as well as structural features. And you can see that in this drawing that was published in uh, Harper's. This is the interior, and uh, I call it the beehive. Um, and it's, it is, uh, although the page is turned around, as you can see, it's oriented correctly, and you can see all the people at work in the Harper's publishing firm. Uh, the structural framework is uh, also very, very easily visible here in this photograph uh, taken when the Harper Building was, uh, complex was demolished in 1925. So New York City was, became the major center for cast iron architecture in the next decades. And I'm just going to show you some representative examples, uh, many of which you will know. This is the Bruce Building, 254 Canal, very nearby erected in 1856-57. Uh, this is another fine structure in the Italian palazzo uh, style, and uh, it's worth looking at. Although, as you can see, it's got a number of signs. The first floor has been redone a number of times, but above you can see the style. Then here's another one uh, built for A.T. Stewart, the A.T. Stewart store. Stewart was the inventor of, of the idea of the department store, and he'd started his business down in lower Manhattan. But by the 1860s, he wanted to build a larger store and move farther uptown. So <coughs> he, had, he hired um, John Kellum, the architect, to erect this large and handsome structure at Broadway and Ninth Street, and it went up in 1862. Uh, here's another view of it. And here you can see this, um, the wide expanse of windows, the substantial amount of um, glass involved in this wall, which is allowed by the, um, the strength of cast iron that means that the columns can be so, the supports can be so narrow, um, and also the repetitive quality. These are a repetition of the same module, and it has a really, um, it really does look classical and it does look like the Italian palazzos, but could be built more easily and more cheaply. Um, in um, 1872, uh, architect J.F. Duckworth erected a handsome warehouse building. This is just a warehouse for fab, um, textile industry. Um, it's 72 Green Street. We'll probably see that in Soho tomorrow. It's affectionately called the King of Green Street. And this stunning recent photograph by Leslie Schwartz shows a very well-kept building. In um, 1874, Par the Paris-trained architect Richard Morris Hunt erected the Roosevelt Building uh, on Broadway in the neo grec style. And I, for time purposes, I'm going to move forward. But cast iron was by no means confined in New York City. On the contrary, it spread quickly and graced the centers of many cities. Again, here are a few examples, starting on the East Coast and moving west. This is the Swain Building in Philadelphia, erected in 1858. It became a victim to urban renewal. Um, I'm going to jump ahead. In the 18, 19, 1860s, Congress voted to replace the copper sheathed wooden dome of the U.S. Capitol, building with a large cast iron dome, 
which was completed in 1865. So this is built during the Civil War, and it, you might say it kind of symbolizes the industrial power of the North, and maybe um, a, a little bit of triumphalism, I don't know. Then we'll go back and look at um, a, uh, in Mobile, Alabama, a handsome store for clothing firm uh, was erected in 1866. Uh, it was one of the largest and most ornate structures built in the old commercial district. And this, as you can see from this detail, it was really uh, cast iron allowed this truly rich decoration to be used. Many cast iron buildings were erected in Chicago. Um, this, is, um, this is a lithograph of East Lake Street in the mid-1860s. It shows a seemingly endless row of cast iron buildings in the uh, Venetian Renaissance style. Uh, Bogardus has one building here, but most of them are by John Van Osdale. Um, St. Louis had a rich um, collection of iron structures in the commercial areas by the Mississippi River, but they fell victim to urban renewal to build the arch, and so they are lost. Um, new cities in the West turned to cast iron as a way to build imposing structures rapidly and relatively cheaply, as is exemplified by this commercial building in Salt Lake City, the Zion Cooperative Mercantile Institution, ZCMI, uh, built in 1876. This is a photograph of the first time it was renovated in 1976, and I think you're gonna hear about a second renovation later today. Um, the rapidly growing cities in the Pacific Coast, particularly California, with the explosive growth arising from the gold rush, erected many cast iron buildings here is, in an undated photograph, the San, ornate San Francisco Savings and Loan Building. And here is a bank in, um, banks you'll notice like this, bank in um, Portland, Oregon, which was demolished in 1955, but the components were saved and later used to expand a sister bank in Salem, Oregon. And so it, it still, in a sense, it still stands. The production of cast iron became a major business in the second half of the 19th century. Bogardus wrote a pamphlet extolling the virtues of cast iron architecture in 1856, and then he, and it said what buildings he'd built, and then in 1858 it was re, uh, reprinted with some more buildings uh, listed. Um, and in uh, 1860, in an ad that was um, just recently found for me by Jay Shockley of the Landmarks Commission, he advertised in, this was in the Express Office Handbook and Directory, and here he calls himself, as you can see, architect in iron, originator, constructor, and patentee of iron buildings, and he lists his office and offers to build iron fireproof buildings, which of course is an excessive claim, um, but uh, it, fire resistant is a much safer word to, to say. Um, so um, Daniel Badger, whom we've met earlier uh, in the, an earlier slide, he was a foundryman by, in origin, a craftsman, but he became very successful, and his architectural ironworks firm uh, supplied cast iron components to builders throughout the country. Uh, the catalog of his wares, and this is the frontispiece of that um, publication, was pub this was published in 1865, and it's one of the preeminent sources for the study of cast iron architecture. It has lots of patterns. It has the drawings of for many buildings that were actually built, and then others that people could order. And the thing about cast iron was that you could choose to have column A and decoration B and uh, a put together a variety of styles so that someone in St. Louis or Salt Lake City or um, other places could in uh, far away could produce a, a, um, a, a fancy building fairly simply by mail order, as it were. Um, and so the virtues of cast iron are many, and I've just talked about one. This method took an industrial approach to iron construction using methods of mass production, interchangeability of parts, and partial prefabrication of portions of the facade, all of which made 
construction relatively cheap and amazingly fast when compared with conventional construction. Cast iron columns were slender but strong, creating uh, the wide window openings. I'm sorry, this, this is Bogardus' um, Architectural Ironworks Badger's foundry plate. So the, the slender columns meant that you could have a lot of glass. Um, so this is the ironclad building in Cooperstown, New York. Compare the substantial, the, the space devoted to windows and to glass with the two conventional buildings on either side. Um, here's another quick example. The um, building on the right is masonry. The building on the left is cast iron. And you can see that you get more window space, even in these two buildings that are, look very, that are meant to look very similar, um, like siblings. <coughs> the um, slender interior columns could open up a lot of space within um, a commercial building, as is shown here in this. It's a Chicago store. Um, because cast iron construction is modular, there is each piece in this ornate thing would be a separate cast separately. But so you could create all kinds of styles. This is an illustration out of Bogardus's pamphlet. And of course, it's a little bit excessive. But what he's trying to prove to you is that you can have um, uh, the most ornamental of uh, architectural uh, elements, but created by casting, by industrial methods, and therefore quickly and cheaply. You don't have to have a, uh, a stonemason carving all of this. Uh, you could, so there are lots of different styles. One, this is the French uh, Second Empire style that was used in the Gilsey Hotel on Broadway, which went up in 1869, or you can even have a fanciful design like this, the so-called Moorish building of Richard Hunt Morris, which he put up in 1872. Cast iron allowed for the construction of extremely large buildings. This is the uh, Tompkins Market and 7th, Armament, 7th Regiment Armory, an unlikely pairing, uh, which was erected in 1860. The market is it's on Third a what it was on Third Avenue just below Cooper Union, taken down in the early um, 1900s. It was at that time when it was built in 1860. It was one of the largest cast iron buildings in New York. The market was on the ground floor, and then the regiment had the top two floors, uh, and the third floor was the drill room. So can you imagine the strength required to have these marching bodies of men? up on the third floor uh, doing their uh, uh, duty in the, for the 7th Regiment. So, uh, and iron could also be used for public amenities. This is a fountain designed by Bartholdi uh, for, in, for the 1876 exposition in Philadelphia. Um, but it's now in Washington, D.C. And you can also see the Botanic Garden, which is one of those cast iron and glass buildings. Because of its strength in, in compression, iron proved to be very well suited to build the building of towers. It permitted the erection of very tall towers that were simple open frames. Uh, James Bogardus built two such <coughs> towers <coughs> for the New York City Fire Department. The first was put up in 1851 on 33rd Street, and this is not it. It was 100 feet tall. And a taller one, built in 1853, was 125 feet. And here we see it, thank you. Here we see it in a, um, in a photograph. Um, this is the Harlem Fire Watch Tower, which was erected in 1856. And it's not as tall as the two Bogardus Towers, but because it sta still stands <coughs> and has been conserved, we can see the construction methods used in the, um, I'm sorry, this is the Harlem Fire Tower. And we can see the, um, the construction methods and how the cast iron and wrought iron components are fastened together. Several years after building these fire, two fire towers that he built, and he did not build the Harlem Fire Tower, Bogardus adapted the open frame cast iron tower 
to construct a shot tower for the McCullough Shot and Lead Company. And it went up in 18, this one was built in 1855. There is a later one that was built uh, the next, the following year. But I'm, I don't have a picture of that. And the point about this one is that uh, this was the first iron shot tower erected and that it is in effect a link to the skyscrapers of um, the late 19th and, and 20th century. So you may ask, what is a shot tower? These were shot towers were used in the making of round gunshot, a process that involved pouring molten lead uh, from way up high at the top um, above a, coal ta a tank of cold water. And as the molten lead fell, the driblets formed into round spheres so that by the time they got into the cold water and were hardened, they were formed into shot. But to achieve the necessary height in masonry construction typically required wide bases of about 40 feet in diameter and thick walls to carry the load. So Bogardus's first shot tower, uh, which is the McCullough, but later owned by the, the Caldwell Lead Company, rose 174 feet, but it was only 24 feet wide uh, at the base. And more importantly, it had very thin walls. In fact, the tower was sheathed in brick only to prevent the falling shot from being blown about by the wind, and the wall played no role in bearing the building's load. Thus, this shot tower is really an iron frame with a curtain wall, and in that sense, it points toward the structural system employed in skyscrapers. Steel frame skyscrapers began to displace cast iron architecture as the preferred type of commercial building in the last years of the 19th century. And what I have here is a picture of the flat iron building during construction. Here you can see the steel framing of the, of the building in construction. Cast iron buildings had generally been um, five or six stories, so some were more, but the taller buildings made a more impressive statement about a business firm and also gave the owner more space that could be rented out. Greater heights were possible not only because of steel, but because of related inventions, such as the safety elevator and the development of water pumps that could produce enough pressure to send water up to the floors. And that shows the interrelationship of um, a variety of inventions in, required in all of these buildings, including going back to cast iron. Um, that it's not just a single thing, it is a uh, sort of a, a matrix of, of, of the time. But I want to point out, just in passing, the cast iron structures continued to be erected into the early 20th century. Uh, here are a couple of examples from Soho. This is an 1891 structure uh, on Lafayette Street. And you can see in this close-up that the architect's style now has moved well beyond the Italian palazzo and the, um, it, it, is a, it is a more modern style, but nonetheless, um, most cast iron buildings were in that, the earlier styles that I have shown you. This is a case of two small residence buildings originally uh, in masonry, but in 1898, they were turned into commercial buildings by adding cast iron fronts and then these pressed iron fancy cornices. And the little Singer building on Broadway was built by an archi architect, Ernest Flagg, in 1904 as a factory for the Singer Sewing Machine Company. And it's got cast iron columns with steel framing and terracotta and wrought iron decorative elements, so he's using all of the possibilities in this eclectic building. As time passed, cast iron fell out of um, favor. Public taste sought more mo a more modern aesthetic, and you can see in these later buildings, that is to say the, um, this building and the Singer building, the little Singer building, uh, this more modern aesthetic. Um, and most people identified cast iron architecture with those florid neo-Renaissance and neo-Baroque styles of the earlier decades. Although the fact is that cast iron can um, lends itself to construction, to any style. But it was typecast in a way by its Victorian origins. Like other structures, cast iron buildings were threatened by major urban fires, and you know the Chicago fire burned a lot of cast iron buildings. And this is in Baltimore, the Baltimore fire, and this is the remnants of the Baltimore sun after the fire. You can see 
the uh, cast iron elements that survived, although when the heat was so intense, cast iron would burn just like other uh, materials, certainly wood. Even more dangerous was demolition as developers set out to build bigger buildings. This was the fate of 50 Murray, which was Bogartis built in the middle of the um, 1850s. It had been erected in 1856 for the firm of Blunt and Sims and was demolished a century later to make way for a taller structure, which is really the story of most of the cast iron buildings that were built in the 19th century. Most dangerous of all the cast iron um, was urban renewal. The urban renewal projects that were carried out in the 50s and the 60s and into the 70s in many of the older cities where the dilapidated commercial districts, which is where the cast iron buildings had been because when they were thriving in the middle of the 19th century, this is where the merchants wanted those fine buildings to um, promote their firm and, and carry out their business in. So many of these commercial districts were leveled in the name of beautification and modernization or to make way for automobile expressways. But even as these dangers threatened cast iron buildings and many other important landmark worthy structures as well, architects and historic preservationists and many others, civic people, just uh, ordinary people, artists in the case of Soho, rallied to save individual buildings or districts, notably by finding new uses um, for, old, for old cast iron buildings. I've already mentioned the effort to save the Lang stores and the 1976 restoration of ZCMI um, in Salt Lake City, but there are many, many others, and a lot of you have been involved in those, including the transformation of a cast iron front that was erected in 1853 for the Adams Safe Company in Boston, and now it's been turned into a mixed use of office and residential space. So many of you in this room are leaders in the effort to preserve cast iron architecture, and what you do will continue and extend the work of earlier preservationists. And here I'm going to introduce a personal note, including my mother, Margot Gale. This is a picture of her in the mid-70s, and she's holding her book on um, cast iron architecture in New York. And then this is Margot in 1995, uh, appropriately by a cast iron fence. Um, so that she, uh, she worked tenaciously and effectively, often in collaboration with some of you to save the rich legacy of cast iron throughout the country and particularly that which is represented in the Soho Historic District of New York, which was created in 1972 by the efforts of many, many people, but she was a very effective leader and organizer in that. Her goal was to raise awareness about the many structures and artifacts that cast, cast iron and otherwise that enrich our urban streetscapes. It is the knowledge and skills of fabricators, architects, and engineers that can achieve that goal by their work in restoring and preserving cast iron architecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. We'd like to take questions at the end of each section. Rather, We'll take them after each section okay. instead of after each speaker, just so we can stay on schedule. Um, our next speaker is Richard Piper. Piper is director of preservation and a partner in the architectural firm of Jan Hurd Picorni Associates in New York City. Since 1995, Piper has been an adjunct professor at Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation where he teaches a course on architectural metals. From 2001 to 2005, Piper directed the exterior restoration of the cast iron and steel cladding of the Battery Maritime Building, and from 1994 to 1997, the restoration of the cast iron drum and dome of the New Jersey State House. He has written numerous publications on historic preservation, including the National Park Service Preservation Brief, on maintenance, repair, and replacement of historic cast stone and has published and lectured widely on this subject. Piper also serves on the boards of numerous historic preservation organizations, including U.S. ECOMOS and Historic Preservation Education Foundation, 
and in his spare time, he is co-chair of this symposium. Thanks, Deborah. Thank you, Carol. That was a nice, a wonderful summary of, uh, of cast iron architecture. Well, as Carol said, it's been about 160 years since the first full cast iron facade buildings were erected in New York City. So it's, it's actually perhaps a little bit surprising then that the first large scale restorations of cast iron building facades in the US weren't undertaken until the 1970s, less than 40 years ago. Since these earliest efforts, the industry has become a lot more formalized and the practitioners more skilled. It wasn't that long ago that if you wanted to, uh, if you had a damaged cast iron face that a fence, the most common course of action was to substitute rolled steel sections for long pickets of cast iron and, uh, and to uh, use slightly smaller and replace damaged finials with slightly smaller aluminum castings made using the original as a pattern. According to Robert Baird of Historical Arts and Casting, the first significant restoration of a cast iron facade in the U.S. was the Zion Cooperative Mercantile Institution, which he says was done in 1974, 73, 74, Carol, not 1976, and this was in Salt Lake City. Now that's not to say that there weren't earlier efforts to repair cast iron, but that date, mid-70s, is probably as good as any for the birth of the architectural cast iron restoration industry in the U.S. Historical arts followed that work uh, with work on the Grand Opera House in Wilmington, Delaware about 1975, and then the California State Capitol in 1976. The earliest significant cast iron restoration in New York City appears to have been on the bridges of Central Park. My personal favorite, the Bow Bridge, which was built from 1859 to 62, is certainly the most photographed footbridge in New York, was partially disassembled and restored in the mid to late 1970s. Some sources say 1974, and documents at, uh, at Central Park say 1978, 79. I love the Bow Bridge because it is structurally counterintuitive. You really can't make cast iron do that. Turns out that uh, the Calvert box hid a couple of uh, wrought iron, riveted wrought iron box girders inside the handrails at, at Bow Bridge, and he pierced through their neutral axis through the through the center of the eye of the box girders so that you could see through the cast iron facing as if the structure didn't exist. In 1979, oh, and the other great thing about this bridge is that it has a cast iron composite beam, cast iron wrought iron composite beam floor deck structure that you can only see if you go on a boat underneath. It's a wonderful, wonderful structure. Historical arts disassembled and restored bridge number 28 in 1979. And the other four cast iron bridges, this is another shot of bridge number 28, another Vaux structure, that's absolutely beautiful. Um, and the other four bridges in Central Park followed over the next 10 years. Robinson Iron made castings for the ceiling panels of Bethesda Terrace in 1982, but the uh, finances halted the tile ceiling restoration and uh, these weren't really installed until 2005, 2006. Now there's been a significant amount of work done to cast iron sub subway entries in New York State, in New York City uh, in the past uh, few years. And some say that this work started in earnest with Prentice Chan's Olhausen's Astor Place kiosks for the Lexington line in 1985. This was a Robinson Iron job that received an, a tremendous amount of press in New York at the time of this construction. And in addition to numerous building facades downtown, some of which you'll see tomorrow on the walking tour, ambitious larger projects in the region have now become more common. Our office worked with Robert Silman Associates and Robinson Iron on the disassembly and reassembly of the New Jersey State House in 1995. And more recently, we worked with uh, Robert Silman Associates and three of our commercial sponsors, Allen Steel, or Allen Ornamental Metals, excuse me. I apologize for that. Um, Historical Arts and Castings and Robinson Iron on the exterior restoration of the 1908 Battery Maritime Building. And this was a, a $50 million project that would have taxed the capacity of any one firm. And of course, last but not least, uh, what is quite certainly the most celebrated cast iron restoration at the moment in New York City, the Donald Judd residence in Soho, owned by the Judd Foundation, practically the only building in Spring Street that is not dedicated to high-end retail, 
um, now shrouded in scaffolding for which the restoration is being designed by Walter Melvin Architects, uh, working with Robert Silman Associates, and it's being worked on by Robinson Iron. This is a, a really exciting project, and uh, I think will be a truly exemplary private cast iron project. So this is a real industry now. But while the people and the resources are now readily available to do the work, the range of interventions which might reasonably be considered by a professional embarking on a treatment of a cast iron facade is still enormous. To what extent should the facade be disassembled? How much of the cast iron is irreparably damaged and requires replacement? What method of surface preparation should be used to clean removed elements and to clean the, those that are left in place? What treatments and paint systems should be used to provide maximum durability for the restored facade? What types of fasteners are optimal? Should sealants be used? What types of failures warrant changes in design? What level of detail is required in construction documents? Well, to help start the discussion today, I put together a short list of issues that I hope you might ponder as our speakers share their experience with us. The first and most basic issue is the question of repair or replace. Gray cast iron is brittle. In 1995, during the planning for the restoration of the New Jersey State House, a man who knows a lot more about cast iron than I ever will sat across the table from me and said, the rule of thumb is, if it's cracked or broken, replace it. I think uh, Doug McLean will add a little credence to that statement a little bit later today. Anyway, well, that's fine if you're replacing every post uh, of a damaged can railing, and for safety reasons, you're replacing them all with ductile cast iron. But what if you have 24 anchor medallions like these at the Battery Maritime Building? Truly iconic pieces, important pieces of cast iron, but you're missing three. And many of the others have small or minor breaks on their mounting stubs. Well, ironically, the very same attribute that made cast iron so cheap to produce makes it more difficult to retain original fabric when restoring it. That is, if you have to make the pattern to replace even one piece, then repairing damaged ones even when this can be done properly, is almost inevitably more expensive than replacing them. In the case of these anchor medallions, we had to convince the client to spend what was probably more money to retain original pieces rather than to replace them. Let's take this one step further. Let's say you have a severely deteriorated cast iron structure like the Mount Morris Fire Watchtower in Harlem that Carol pictured, the last remaining fire watchtower of the ones which dotted Manhattan after the disastrous fires of the early 19th century. At the moment, it's propped up with a supplementary steel frame, here painted white. But eventually, even this cast iron is going to have to be disassembled and restored. And if you replace every cracked or broken piece, you'll be left with a replica. What do you do? Second issue, extent of disassembly. You go on the walking tour tomorrow, uh, stop and buy coffee at Dean and DeLuca's, and look at the storefront. It was cleaned and painted several years ago, but when they did the painting of the columns, they didn't remove the small ornamental castings uh, on the front of the, that are screwed to the front of the columns. Uh, and these are continuing to rust underneath, and a couple have popped off, and the rust spots have been primed over. A few weeks ago, I was talking to Phil Ganella. Uh, from writer group about the outline for his talk on surface preparation and paint. And at the end of the outline he said to me, well that's 45 minutes right there and I haven't gotten even to my favorite subject, surfaces which can't be prepared. <laughs> Unless you remove a piece of cast iron, there's some portion of it which won't be cleaned and painted. Now the extent of disassembly obviously depends upon a lot of things. The client's budget, the severity of deterioration, the occupancy of the building, the sanctity of interior finishes, but ultimately the durability of the restoration depends upon the extent of disassembly as much as it depends upon anything else. We also need to know, and need to realize that what we're doing is a repetitive process, not a unique event. The ZCMI building that was restored in 73, 74, or 76, depending upon who you believe, is being taken apart again. And the Bow Bridge, which was partially disassembled, uh, disassembled in the mid-1970s, was again disassembled in 1998. 
and it's likely to go through some deck repairs in the not too distant future. Our job as preservation architects, conservators and restorers to figure out how to repeat this process as infrequently as possible. Third issue, surface preparation. Many of you are familiar with the standards of the SSPC, formerly the Steel Structures Painting Council, now the Society of Protective Coating, and their wonderful, geeky, argument-settling field books. I just love this one. I have a copy, actually. I have it in my pack right now if you want to see it. Um, this book classifies rust into five or six types, and then it pictures what each of these types of rust looks like when prepared to different standards of cleaning. The guide was written, though, for the preparation of steel, but it's often extended to apply to cast iron, not completely appropriately, but usefully. Standard air abrasive cleaning, which of course is a no-no for many architectural materials like brick and, and bronze, has long been the gold standard for the preparation of iron and steel. But there are a lot of different air abrasive techniques. Which ones are best? And what if you can't air abrasively clean because of the, the work environment? What are the issues with other forms of surface preparation? Phil Ganella will be speaking about this in detail this afternoon. Fourth issue. Oh, and then we have the, the, the other issue that, that Phil said his, was his favorite topic, surfaces you can't prepare. Anywhere you have a riveted surface and it can't be unbolted, you're not preparing that surface and there's rust behind it. Disassembly may be required. Fourth issue is finishes. If we're trying to avoid the very expensive process of taking these buildings apart, how do we treat the cast iron, and, well, for that matter, the wrought iron and steel structure that's hidden behind the cast iron classing, cladding so that the standard service life of an optimum paint job, 25 years, doesn't necessitate disassembly on that schedule? Do we just paint? Do we apply a layer of zinc and then paint? And given that chemical conversion layers, stable oxides that have been applied to steel and everything from handguns to sheetrock screws for years and are now applied to automobile body parts to prepare them for paint, might a system like this work as well as zinc? Well, if you're working on a building from the last decade of the 19th century or the first decade of the 20th century where the cast iron is mixed with liberal amounts of steel, like the Battery Maritime Building, the steel is a natural for hot dip galvanizing, although you got to be very careful you prepare the hot dip galvanized surfaces appropriately for painting. Um, now you can't dip, the problem is you can't dip cast iron in a warp, but you can apply a zinc or zinc aluminum thermal spray, which gives you anywhere from three to 15 mils of zinc on the surface and it provides a great tooth for the primer. That's raw cast iron on the left hand side. Those are samples from Robinson Iron and, and that's thermal sprayed cast iron on the right-hand side with 10 to 15 mils of zinc on it. Thermal spray is also known as metallizing. And um, it's an air gun process. And for the most part, this is done in an enclosed booth in a shop environment. Not always, but for the most part. We first used, my office first used this technique in 1991 on the heavily rusted wrought iron work of the Century Club on 43rd, 43rd Street, where we brush blasted the steel, pickled the, p brush blasted the wrought iron, pickled the wrought iron to remove rust, and then metallized it. And 20 years later, it still looks great. Highly ornate cast iron can be difficult to air abrasively clean, however. And there have been recent efforts to apply dip treat conversion layers to cast iron, as they have previously been done to steel. It'll be interesting to see how these applied, how the applied durability of these treatments compares to metallizing with zinc or zinc aluminum. Fifth issue, fasteners. If you've ever watched a cast iron building being disassembled, you've noticed that on buildings in which the fasteners are visible on the exterior face, which you see occasional small um, <coughs> slot head uh, countersunk screws, a standard technique to remove the piece is to torch off the head of the fastener with an oxyacetylene torch. Now, this has to be done very carefully to avoid blowing out the countersink on the cast iron, but it's a, a very useful and quick technique. Obviously, when you get a building partially disassembled, if you're taking down an entire facade, you can work from behind. You don't have to work from the front, but still blowing out the fasteners with an oxyacetylene 
uh, torch is the way that individual pieces are often removed. In early cast iron, however, and this is again the Lang source, this is a picture slightly later than the ones that, uh, that, that Carol showed you. It's after much of the demolition has been done in the Washington market area. Um, this was the oldest extant building, cast iron front building in New York City before it was disassembled. If you looked at the detail photographs, and if you, if you noticed from the photographs that Carol showed, most of the bolts are generally inside the castings, and they're not exposed on the exterior face. To disassemble cast iron like this, you have to remove interior finishes. In an occupied building, tenants just hate that. <laughs> you know? Two other questions about fasteners to ask are material and appearance. Oh, since much of the damage to cast iron is caused by rusting wrought iron or steel fasteners, I'm very fond of stainless steel. And if you want to talk to me at the reception about the possibility for, of galvanic deterioration, I'd be very happy to talk to you about at the reception as long as I have a glass of wine in my hand. <laughs> but to replicate the elaborate fastener patterns and appearance on many buildings in stainless steel, you may find yourself fabricating a significant number of custom fasteners at no small expense. Here are some cast iron rivet head bolts and flat flat rivet heads replicating the originals at the Battery Maritime building. But no small extents, no small expense, I meant no small expense. Case in point, custom turned stainless steel rivet head bolts used at the Battery Maritime building, and we used a lot of them. Price, about $7 each. Sixth issue, sealants. How can I say this nicely? Cast iron buildings were not erected with contemporary waterproofing standards in mind. <laughs> Horizontal joints generally have pieces lapped to prevent water penetration, but vertical joints are usually just butted. This is the inside of a vertical joint at the New Jersey State House built in 1889. The vertical joints are bolted to small interior plates so that the cast iron pieces will align on the exterior, but the interior plates are often short or discontinuous, leaving holes to the exterior either above or, or below the plate. If you weren't thinking about what you were doing on the outside, you could squirt an entire tube of caulk into one hole. There's often a very generous interstitial space between the exterior clouding, the outside skin, <laughs> and the inside skin. So sometimes you can get away with a certain amount of leakage without too many problems. When it becomes, but if the cast iron skin ends above an occupied space, like it did at the, at the New Jersey State House, um, leakage can become a much larger problem. And at the New Jersey State House, what we did was to apply a waterproof membrane to these cast iron base pieces, a paintable waterproof membrane to these cast iron base pieces at the bottom. And we actually built interior bathtubs underneath those wash pieces as a kind of a belt and suspenders approach. At the Battery Maritime Building, on the other hand, none of the cladding abutted finish space or ended above finish space. And we galvanized the structural steel, and we used virtually no sealant whatsoever. It was just one wash surface that we had to retain the cast iron and apply to a, a sealant system to. I urge you to ask the speakers lots of questions about sealants. Seventh issue, design changes. It's romantic and tempting to assume that the original builders knew much, much, much more about cast iron design than we do. On occasion, however, they did make design error errors. Cast iron is great under compressive loads, unless, of course, the compressive load is oblique to the axis of the piece. Pieces of the base of the Battery Maritime Building had shattered from eccentric loading, so new structural steel was inserted to, to take the load of the vertical cladding, and the base pieces were hung off of the new supports. One other common error, especially in early 20th century cast iron, is to, was to pour concrete behind the base assemblies to carry heavy superposed loads. These bases on the front of the building were filled to concrete up to here to support this load, but 
Some of these pieces had cracked because of water leakage and frost lenses between the cast iron and the concrete base. You frequently find this problem with cast iron balustrades where the bottom newels have been filled with concrete in the 20th century. So, water, so get rid of the concrete and provide a new frame. I think uh, Doug McLean is also going to speak about this a little bit later today. Eighth issue, construction documentation. We have an entire panel to discuss this. Is the format for a set of documents for an 800-piece facade the same format you want to use for a large ferry terminal with nearly 9,000 pieces? What format communicates adequate information to protect the client without intimidating or overwhelming the bidders with information and raising the bid price? One thing is certain. These buildings are a little bit like Eli, Eli Whitney's mythical interchangeable parts muskets. While the castings may start out much the same, once they've been filed and ground and fitted into larger assemblies, they are no longer completely interchangeable. At the Battery Maritime Building, we were also surprised to find that some apparently identical pieces, like these arch voussoirs, inexplicably differed in size by several inches. It turns out it was because the arches that they enclosed were several, several feet different in size, and we still don't know why. So whatever system you use for documentation, so it also serve as a basis for identification that follows the piece through cleaning, finishing, and reassembly. Schedules are also helpful for clarifying what pieces are made of, thus clarifying what treatment they might need. These large brackets at the Battery Maritime Building, these pieces here, are actually single pieces of cast iron whereas the neighboring small brackets are largely riveted steel. And of course, they were treated very, very differently. I'll let the engineers, the architects, and the fabricators argue about construction documents in a session later this morning. Ninth issue, logistics and teamwork. Here's New York. Here's the Birmingham Talladega area. And here's Salt Lake City. When we did the disassembly of the New Jersey Dome, and rotunda, the cast iron pieces were individually wrapped in plastic, stacked on the back of a flatbed truck, and trucked to Alabama for abating, cleaning, repair, unit replacement, and reassembly. Parts of the Battery Maritime Building went to Salt Lake City for treatment. And when they came back partially reassembled, though, they generally had to be further assembled off the site into larger pieces for installation in the field. In our case, this was done at a steel your firm's yard in the Bronx. So, depending upon how big your project is and the size of your work site, especially if it's a narrow street in Soho, you may expect to have a local work site and a few teams collaborating to get the cast iron back on your building. So, these are the things that I'll be asking questions about today myself. I'm sure that I missed an issue or two and I, I hope somebody will take issue with something that I've said so that we can get a spirited discussion going. We have an exceptional group of speakers. We have a full day of talks. We have about an hour and a half of open bar and food at the reception. <laughs> and that will allow you to buttonhole the participants. So enjoy yourself. Uh, it's time for, I think we, I don't know whether, are there any questions? I would prefer to hold questions until, uh, for these first two talks until later today if we could. I think everybody would like to have some coffee. And, uh, and please try to get back promptly. That's, that's, 